the chef doesn't like it if we if we don't break at noon. But we have a window, and I thought uh, what I might do in the context that Mark has set up, uh, open-minded, wonderful, dialectical, centrist, uh, non-judgmental, pure, fair attention to the context, <laughs> I thought perhaps I would share with you the Four Noble Truths. Uh, since we're sort of associating all this with, and we're trying to deal with anxiety, depression, and addiction. And um, so, Buddha's therapy, let's call it. Let's call it that. And how many of you could recite what are the Four Noble Truths just right off the bat? How many? Hold up your hand. Whoops. Oh, I'm glad. That's the right choice, I think. <laughs> okay. But first, you have to set the context. So Shakyamuni Buddha, after a lot of struggles, uh, attained some sort of, supposedly, attained uh, realization of the nature of reality right down to past the subatomic particles, uh, right to the, the void, Euclid's call, uh, which he discovered was not a black hole. It was, uh, if anything, a pulsar you know, beyond the black holes. And um, he was so grouped out, and he's, he was very happy, he said, profound, peaceful, uncomplicated, luminous, and uncreated, like an elixir of immortality, of deathlessness, is this, is this reality I have found, I have experienced. Whoever I show it to, teach it to, they probably won't understand. I think I'll just hang out here in the, in the garden, the jungle garden, and uh, without speaking, and stay here happily alone. Uh, but that was uh, the second part. He then, after a while, spent apparently something like uh, seven weeks, a couple months, um, relaxing on his own, enjoying this insight. Although from my point of view, he taught the Flower Ornament Sutra during that time in other planes. He wasn't actually just, well, you know, everything he did subsequent to that apparently was relaxing. <laughs> Non-judgmental, uh, just realizing reality, realizing the nature of reality by being reality to the full, let's say, which is infinite, to the infinite full. So then he thought about who he would share. He was encouraged. Actually, he had a conversation with God. Uh, Brahma, whose name was Brahma in India, who was considered the creator god by some people in India, since Indians were always very diverse, and, and, um, but a very strong majority considered Brahma to be the creator. And he had this conversation with God, who was very delighted to have someone who understood the nature of reality, which he said he did not himself quite understand. But he appealed to him, he said, oh no, don't sit there and not to tell people what you have discovered. Or, they, of course, you can't really tell them, because everyone has to experience it for themselves. And words will not suffice to explain it. God actually was that enlightened already. But he said, one thing that I'm upset about is that people think I'm omnipotent, and that I created everything. And, you know, it's a little bit my fault, because when, the, when, the, when I first came into this round of the universe, which was not the first one, when I first came to it, I seemed to be the first person here all by myself at first. And I just showed up in this new universe, and you know, I was in some very comfortable plane there, but there was nobody else around, and I didn't quite know what was happening. And then a whole bunch of other gods, you know, godlings, like angels or godlings, whatever you want to call them, suddenly showed up, because those in the heavenly plane, they don't need a womb, it's not a long thing like that, they just immediately, they're called, born by apparition. And when they showed up, and they saw me there, preceding them, they said, Dada! <laughs> and at first I said, I'm not your Dada. I, I want to, let's figure it out, what's going on, let's work together and figure this out here. And then they got all freaked out looking. So I said, okay, okay, I'm Dada, everything is fine. Oh, <laughs> don't worry. And then they seemed so at ease, etc. So, so then that's sort of, I've been letting it sort of spread by rumor throughout the galaxy, 
that I do know what's going on and I did create it and I am omniscient and so on. But then, human beings and other beings that suffer get mad and they think, well, he's omnipotent. How come and they blame me? And I'm, I'm very loving, friendly. You know? I'm Brahma, I'm God, you know? I'm very friendly. And I'm the top God. And the other gods kind of like defer to me. But I'm not omnipotent. And I didn't create their suffering. And uh, I'd like you to inform them of that fact. <laughs> that would be good. I like it when they worship me when they're on top of the world. But when they have suffered badly and get really pissed off with God, me, I don't like the vibe. <laughs> so, you know, my, my poll numbers deteriorate. <laughs> so please tell them. Now we're all in it together, and yeah, I'm, in, I'm not been created perfectly without suffering, and they also have not arranged things perfectly without suffering. So please, uh, uh, yeah, you know, tell them. And then during that time, apparently, he had that conversation, that 49 days. So then he decided he would tell the human beings. So then he went, he, he, he used his sort of, what they call divine eye, divine ear, like ability to know things remotely uh, by sort of in the collective cosmic mind or something, you know what was going on. And he realized that his two yoga teachers that he had stopped with on his way to his own solitary six years of extreme self-mortifying asceticism, uh, he self-punishment, attempt to withdraw from the world. Uh, he, those two yoga teachers who had taught him certain samadhis, they had passed away, he realized. So he, because first he wanted to go and form them because they were very deep people, but not quite there, you know, and he had not stayed with them. And, um, uh, but they had passed away. So then he remembered that he had been with these five other self-mortifying uh, ascetics uh, who were in really bad shape. And he knew where they were, in, in near Benares, in a place called Deer Park. So he walked from Bodh Gaya to there, supposedly, in a day or two, and um, and then he came up to see them, these five guys. And um, when they saw him, they said, oh, here comes that Turkey Gautama, Siddhartha. And he gave up our rigid regime of self-punishment. And look at it, he looks well fed, he looks relaxed, he looks happy, and he's glowing. And uh, he must have been eating, I don't know what, you know, like taking vitamins or something. Forget about this guy. Don't, don't even get up when he comes nearby. But when he did, but his field as he came close was such they felt sort of just lifted, and they were really nice. And then they said to him, "Oh, uh, okay, hello, friend Siddhartha, hi, pal," kind of thing like that. He said, "Don't call me pal. <laughs> so I'm not your pal. I'm a Buddha now. I'm Shakyamuni." Actually, he was their best friend, but he didn't want them thinking he was just like he had been. And then he looked at them, and these were five guys who were really funky. They hadn't had a square in six years. They hadn't had a bath. They hadn't cut their toenails or fingernails. They hadn't cut their hair. They were really like, and he looked at them and said, this is something. <laughs> it didn't really take a Buddha or he'd be the genius looking at them. He didn't qualify the this, what he meant by the this. He later, he said. <laughs> so people will only have understood from that over the years that Buddha was a kind of killjoy, you know, horrible ascetic, and this is suffering means everything is suffering, and the world is no good at all, and it's horrible. And, all this. and the, the Pope Benedict was very upset about it. <laughs> So depressing. How can anybody be a Buddhist? And when, when he said it's all suffering, and he should have been really jolly and happy, like we are in the Vatican. <laughs> and and uh, they were very upset. So people have generally, even in Asia, the Hindus, some of them were very upset about, Chinese Confucian people were upset about, and um, a lot of people were upset about this misunderstanding. But he qualified that later to say, that the unenlightened life will be frustrating. And if you think about it, his near contemporary Socrates, 
was reported to have said, the unexamined life, unexamined life is not worth living. Yeah. And Buddha never said it wasn't worth living. He just said, it will be frustrating, it will be suffering. The unenlightened life, which is like yeah, similar to the unexamined life, something similar to that. But his, of course, so then he taught what was called the Four Noble Truths. And this is, you know, this is a therapeutic model, 100%. It's a total therapeutic model. And uh, first noble truth, and it's called noble truth. The reason he called them noble is he took the word that at that time in India was a class term for the upper class, higher class. And he redefined it, which of course they didn't realize right away, but he redefined it to be a cognitive term. And noble meant someone who is properly shrunk. That's what, meaning they are not completely trapped in their own world of self-enclosure, but they have become at least enlightened enough. And there are, there are of course, you know, huge uh, spectrum of, of degrees, but somewhat enlightened enough to realize that others are equally as alive and important than themselves. And indeed, other, they're more of the others. And so actually they have a sense of empathy for those others, by understanding the nature of the self, they have then become aware of the others in a sort of empathic way, and therefore are noble. They have like a noblesse oblige, they have care for them. They feel their feelings are of equal importance to their own, and perhaps because there's so many more of them, more important to their own. So they have become at least altruistic enough to be considered noble by this new definition of noble. So he called them noble truths because these things are true for someone who has achieved that greater degree of openness and sensitivity. And they're not true for the ordinary self-enclosed, self-defended, shut off, self, you know, self-centered, you know, uh, pathologically self-centered type of person, which is everyone, more or less, who has not gone through some kind of a opening process, and especially more males than females in his culture. And generally, I think since then, last few thousand years, we're still stuck there at some point. In fact, I would definitely say. And um, so, so, there, so that's what he called the noble truths. So the first one is the symptoms of the unenlightened life, which is the self-centered, both metaphysically self-centered by thinking that the self is the most important and greatest reality and it's a fixed and it almost an, even an absolute almost sort of thing never change my real identity you know? and uh, um, that the unenlightened life stuck that way will be frustrating because there will be the suffering that the happiness the, the momentary relief and happiness what, what people think of as mundane happiness temporary relief from anxiety, depression, and addiction, <laughs> that moment, those moments of momentary relief will not last. They will come to an end rather quickly. So it's called the suffering of change. The happiness is called the suffering of change. And then the suffering of suffering is obvious. You know, that we, we hurt ourselves, you know, we feel anxious, depressed, and, and, uh, and addicted. And then uh, the, the, the suffering of the overall structure of you being separate from the universe and you not be, be and therefore being basically ultimately, temporarily ultimately, and cosmically ultimately, if you become more aware, overwhelmed by the other of the persons and things, which is <coughs> vast, vastness around you, which you're afraid of, of which many aspects of which you're afraid and frustrated by it and whatever. So, so that's the first noble truth. But then the, then the second noble truth is that that suffering of yours has a cause, the origin of it, what it is. Now that's the diagnosis, why you're suffering. And there that is this, this delusion. Ignorance is not as good a word for it as delusion, although I do use a more cognitive word than delusion, but which is the same as delusion, which is misknowledge, or like misunderstanding. 
because it's more importantly than a passive failure to know something, it's a wrong knowing of something. Like every person who is unenlightened, who lives an unexamined life, they know that they are the main thing. They know that. They know I'm me. They know that I'm different from everything else. And they, they may have a, they sort of, and it's, it's a weird kind of knowing because they actually haven't found themselves as different from everybody else. They are just conditioned to assume they are different from everybody else. And therefore, that assumption is so ingrained and so strongly habituated at the subconscious, visceral, instinctual level as well as the conscious level that they assume that there's a, there's a me in here, a point of subjectivity that is somehow apart from what I'm subjective of, that is what I am, the, the, the consciousness that perceives, that never changes, no matter what happens to me. I'm always me. When I see a picture of myself at 15 at a picnic, if I can remember the situation, I sort of, I sort of identify, oh yeah, that's, I'm the same me now, 50 years later, 60 years later. I'm exactly the same, although of course I'm utterly different, but I, there's a point, seems to me to be a point that never changed. And that's my identity, even though I never really found it. But I feel that's, that's it's there. Then there are theories that say, yes, of course, that's true. You have this fixed immortal soul that never changes, that's the real you. It's like some kind of barcode created by mm. some absolute being that's outside of the universe spark of that absolute being, for example, in most monotheistic traditions, they have a thing like that. And um, materialists have a sort of nothingness that never changes. Because the brain is just making the illusion that I'm here, but my, I've never changed being nothing, not having a mind or a soul, etc. You know, they're all different versions. So theories will reinforce that feeling that there's something unchanging at the root of all my subjective experience. And that is a misknowledge. That is the delusion. And then that's elaborated, very complicated. And from the, once there is that delusion, that the real thing is this real me, sort of stuck temporarily in this, in this interrelatedness that is very problematic, then I automatically sort of want more, I want to be bigger, I want to consume more, I want to dominate more of this apparent infinity around me, to sort of be able to withstand it, to stand up to it, to overcome, like I like to be a king or a god, or, you know, somehow become bigger than, than the other. So that's a greed. That's a, that's, I want to join more things. That's a lust and greed and desire, you know. Secondary to this primal illusion. And then, uh, since that's what I want, in this hopeless situation, I assume every other being wants the same thing, and therefore they want to kind of consume me. And so I'm aggressive with them, and I hate those who want to do that. And so then hatred, aggression, hostility, aversion, people sort of politely say, hmm. I have, and that's Freud's Eros and Thanatos, right? Hmm. I, that, you know. But they are secondary to um, the delusion, the the, the delusive sense of separateness, an absolute separateness of self and the universe. Okay, so those are, that's the diagnosis, that's the, the acknowledgement of the symptom, and the diagnosis of the cause of the symptom. Now the prognosis, and this is of course what, why Buddha himself was a happy camper, why he said, like an elixir of immortality is this is this reality I have discovered, which is profound, meaning it's the real bottom deep reality. It's peaceful, it's luminous, it's uncomplicated, and uncreated, it's always been there. And now I, it's, so it's the reality that I've always been, isn't it? What a relief. And uh, so the reason he's feeling relieved uh, is that's the prognosis. And in his knowledge of the nature of it, since he was, a self-centered, spoiled brat prince who'd been the, the love of everybody in his culture and society. He'd been in the top power position. He was about to be king. Father was very upset that he, wouldn't, that he couldn't abdicate and, and coronate him at, because he'd reached the moment of that by having a son when an Indian royal system 
uh, who, and uh, in that time in the Indian society, the royal people were more powerful than the priest people, or the intellectual people, you know, because military, military, they were the military people, and they had, they, although the Brahmins will tell you they were superior, they actually weren't. The, the Department of Defense was in charge, as, as still they are. And, uh, but the prognosis is, it's all right, like that famous Ray Charles song. Everything is all right. It always has been. You know, we're lying on the breast of Nirvana, of mother, mother, of mother emptiness. But he didn't really elaborate all those things. He didn't emphasize that. He just said he was very minimalistic, knowing that these self-torturing, self-centered, deeply self-escaping people would be contemptuous of someone who said this is all fine <laughs> right away, you know. And all he said was, there is a freedom from this suffering. So there is a cure, in other words, which is the prognosis, right? Then the therapy, fourth noble truth. There is a path to the prognosis, to the, to the nirvana, to the freedom from suffering. There is a, a route you can take, you know, because I know that you don't feel that it is your present reality, and I'm not pushing non-duality on you. Oh, I am actually hinting at it, but I'm not pushing it. Uh, I'm just saying there is a freedom, giving you that in much encouragement. And then I know you're going to misinterpret that initially, but maybe because the way the path is, it's an educational path. So it has eight components, that education. And I know you'll find your way there. And I'm encouraging you from the outset that you can. Of course, an educator who has realized, of course, because he, one thing that he realized, he also is not omnipotent. Buddha is not omnipotent either. And he realized that he had to realize this reality of himself, himself. And he couldn't, no, no, no verbal formulaic teaching that he would be given by another, even another Buddha, would be in, uh, sufficient, no authority, in other words, would be sufficient to enable him to realize his own reality. He had himself to explore and to find it, and he had the capability to do it. His intelligence, his human intelligence, enabled him to do it. And therefore, other humans could do it. So, that's, so he had to tell his potential students that they could, if they followed the path, reach freedom from suffering. Because that's, other people were not saying that. His colleagues were saying, Oh, you, you know, there were others who said, well, you don't have to do anything, it'll just happen to you at some point. Others were saying, God will, God will save you. Others were saying, you don't need to be saved because you don't exist. That's what modern materialists tell you, actually. Ultimately, you don't need to be saved, just die. And then you won't exist, so you won't suffer. They do uphold, they hold out that promise, just like any priest, a natural scientist. I'm sorry, but they do. They're just like high priests, actually. My university, they are the high priests, uh, late, and, and they promise you annihilation, which, you know, and you're supposed to think that's really, will suck, because I won't be able to have burgers anymore, <laughs> or, or nice, clean, holistic, vegetarian food. But, but on the other hand, I won't suffer, be that, so that's cool. I'm guaranteed anesthesia. I'm guaranteed permanent Motrin in, in a lethal dose. So, I'll be free of anxiety, depression, and addiction. <laughs> so, 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 they weren't telling them that. Whereas Buddha said, no, you, have, you can realize your true nature, and your real nature, and when you do, you will be free of that suffering, because you have put a stop to the cause of it, which is the delusion. Because your understanding and your realization of, the, of your true nature is a wisdom, which is the opposite of delusion. It's realism. It's realistic awareness of the nature of reality. Okay? So now we come to the Eightfold Path, and, uh, which is the therapy. And guess what? The first branch of the Eightfold Path is not meditation. <laughs> Although, don't get me wrong, because no, I'm talking to a bunch of meditators and saying it's not the panacea, because it is really important. It's the last branch. Samadhi, you know, concentration, it is. And maybe it's an aspect of the, of the seventh and eighth branches. 
But the first branch is what's called right. In your books, you're going to read right worldview. I don't like right, right and wrong for those two, Samyak and Mitya. True and false, is, it, it's not wrong to say right and wrong or true and false, but right and wrong is immediately understood by people as right and wrong according to some rule. You know, like you're, you've, you follow the rules, so you're right and right just. But I prefer it, it's not a rule, it's according to reality. So I, and I got this from Alan Wallace. That's the first place I saw this, and it just went click, I must admit, from my, my former student and good friend. Um, realistic is much better. Realistic and unrealistic is better than true and false because of its connotations for us. So realistic worldview is the first branch. And that is actually the wisdom branch. So wisdom comes first, right away in the path. And wisdom is not just mysticism or something like the, you know, like having an empty mind or something like that, not at all. Wisdom is, is the word used for wisdom is the same word used for intelligence, but intensified. So super intelligence is what it's what it means. Pradnya. Nya is is kno, same root, Indo-European linguistic root for knowing. Knowing, right? We have a K-N, right? Kno, we don't pronounce the K, because it's hard to pronounce. In the, in Sanskrit, which is a sort of primal Indo-European language, it's gnya. Jnya. It's a J, it's even hard to pronounce. Znya. So pra and pra means super. Intense. And, and the way you super know something is you first learn about it. You know, you learn what it's made of and how it works, and it's the whole thing about it. What, and you probe deeper and deeper, you drill down, try to find the full reality of something. And then you, you come up with different angles and perspectives on whatever you're examining. And then you sort of, you know, interlock them. You, Debate about them. You say, "Well, this is the only partial, and that's deeper." And so you critically investigate how you see the thing, and then finally you may get to a point of, "Oh, it must be like this or that," and then you concentrate on that, and you come to a deep experience of it. And these are, and so you have what's called the wisdom born of learning, the wisdom born of critical reflection, which is a kind of meditation, like Descartes' meditations were critical reflection. What they call the meditation of the Descartes, critical reflection. And any kind of discursive meditation, in a way, is critical reflection. And then you come to one point of meditation, where through the critical reflection, you kind of come to a, to a brink of, it sort of must be that, but you know, maybe there's some doubt left, but you kind of understand, or at least you understand what it isn't, and now you have to focus on it. And then you, you, you combine a very high degree of concentration with that. So then that's wisdom born of what we could also call meditation or concentration, you know, non-discursive meditation. So that's the first branch. And the key there is that he reports right away negation. That's why indeed even he expressed freedom. The word freedom, for example, we don't realize that because we live in America where people like W shout about freedom, let's fight for freedom. Oh, they hate our freedom. And like he comes from Texas, so he has freedom. He thinks. <laughs> freedom is a negation. You can't possess freedom. He's salt free. Where's the freedom? There's just no salt. <laughs> right? Sugar free, trouble free, depression free, anxiety free, addiction free. The freedom itself is just the lack of the addiction, anxiety, and the depression. The freedom is different. Free means free, you know, absent, lacking. Self-free would be a translation of selflessness. Free of self, a fixed self. So, so he, he expressed the prognosis in a negational way because the type of cognition that you have when you negate is different from the kind of cognition you have when you affirm, you know, positive cognition. And the delusion about your misascribing absolute status to things and yourself and selves is sort of confirmed every time you eyes, oh, there's a book, oh, there's Mark, oh, there's the cup, 
that and the cup is a real thing and my concept of cup fits right over that cup and it goes to its essence and my concept of mark goes to its essence my concept of myself goes to my essence my first pronoun comes out of my essence i ego ich for dear Freud said ich he didn't say ego actually he said ich and and uh, whereas when you don't find something well, is there a book in this room? And you look everywhere, oh, okay. At some point you just stop looking. Is there an elephant in this room? Uh, okay, you stop looking. You don't ever find the elephant lessness of the room. You're just free of the worry about being trampled by the elephant. So he defined the prognosis as a freedom. Nirvana means freedom. But that's a negation. And, every, and we, negation is a very important thing in our practical lives, right? We won't, we won't eat unless it's MSG free. We won't go to that Chinese restaurant. You know, if, we, if we're a vegetarian, we won't eat unless it's meat free. If we, even if we're, if we're an organic kind of a, you know, meat eater, we won't eat it unless it's hormone free. Organic grass fed, whatever, 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 whatever. Right? So, so it's not that even though you don't really close around the negation, it's still a powerful thing. Very, very powerful, right? It involves how we negotiate interrelating with things, right? So by saying niroda, niroda means cessation, nirvana means extinction, blowing out. And finally, modern, we're so lucky to live in a modern world where we have hip language. Because finally, we, in our popular language, we have nirvana right there. When you have gone to a great concert, and people say, how was it? And you really had a great time, what do you say? I was blown away. <laughs> and that nirvana means being blown away, blown out. You know? The little flame of my anxiety, depression, and addiction was temporarily mm. blown away even by aesthetic experience. So, but as the prognosis is, you can be blown away, which we're not afraid of, right? It's like that. If somebody said some deep negation, we would be really freaked out, maybe. So, although we're not, actually, as materialists in our culture, even though we have spiritual theories, but in the visceral way we go around, we go around being confirmed by authorities in our culture that we don't have to worry about anything beyond death, and perhaps our cemetery plot, and our life insurance, and our dear ones. But otherwise, we don't have to really worry about the state of our own consciousness beyond death. We're assured of that. And subliminally, we think so. Even we think we're a Buddhist and we believe in it, we say, but actually, we don't live as if we believe in it, mostly. We really don't. Or we would change our way we live, for sure. So, um, so the first one is this realistic worldview. And then you might think, well, realistic worldview means that you have to believe in Buddha, you have to believe in some doctrines, you have to believe in this and that, you know, no. All you have to believe in is causation, actually. That's all you have to believe in, isn't that odd? When you really come down to it, the only thing that realistic worldview means is that you are open to causation. You're open to desire. It's one kind of causation. <laughs> But any also open to other kinds of things. So it's causation. That's the realistic worldview. Is you're open to causation, and you know you're ready to work on to, on getting rid of negative causation. You don't even put it in terms of cultivating positive causation right away. You could because you you know the underlying life is suffering. It has this cause of this delusion. There is a ability to be free of it. And so, okay, I can see that causation, and that particular causation of that delusion, I'm going to do something about it. So you're open to causation. You, and that's very deep, because that, and it's theoretical also at the first moment. It's intellectual, it's rational. Because actually your unconscious self-habit, identity habit, absolute uh, identity habit, absolute self-habit, absolute self-sense, that means, is not open to causation. Because you think there's something unchanging 
fixed there. That's you. That's the real you. And actually, you project into other things some sort of fixed essence into them. Look at all world philosophies. Plato, I, the idea, you know, the self, um, you know, essence or the self idea that it's, it's an abstract absolute that instantiates itself in any phenomenal person. The tableness that makes the table a table, etc. Look at the metaphysics of, of theories based on that delusion, on the experience of being driven by such a delusion, that everything has an absolute thing or it would all become meaningless and chaotic. You know? The attempt to kind of control conceptually this world in which you feel anxious, depressed, and addicted. So, by, uh, yeah, that delusion is called addiction, actually. It's people translate it affliction. The word is klesha, or kilesa in Pali, or klesha in Sanskrit. And klesha means something that twists you. It's a, it twists you and causes you pain. So, therefore, people who translate it as affliction, which I used to do, it, are wrong. Because affliction is the pain, you know. This is the cause of the affliction. And addiction is actually the way, it, the weight of that word in our culture is really perfect for klesha. Because the reason that you're gripped by addiction is addiction seems to give you a bonus. It isn't that heroin or cocaine or, or whatever, or your egotistical habits are that unpleasant to you, or that anger is unpleasant to you. You know, you're feeling weak and oppressed and bugged by people, and then you feel and you feel kind of relieved when you grow up and you sort of blast them away, you feel. And this gives you a feeling of relief. When you, when you have a kind of desire for something, you're imagining some sort of unity or union with that, and um, food or, or people or sex or whatever it is, or position or status or wealth. And so, and so it gives you a buzz. And, and, but then it doesn't satisfy. Then you need more of it. Then you need more anger, then you need more aggression, and then you need more delusion and more confirming your self-importance over others. That's a specific delusion of self. And so, like an addictive substance, it, it seems to be helpful, and then you crash. You know, and it makes you weaker and worse and worse. You follow? Mm -hmm. You get more and more psychotic in the, the delusion of self. Right? So addiction is perfect. In the sense that it's, it's the seductive surface of it, but then it harms, harms you. you know? So, so it causes pain, in other words. So, so you get you get this theoretical idea, insight, rational insight, that there cannot be an absolute self or anything separate from the process of causation when you develop a realistic worldview that everything I, that's important to me is, is engaged in a process of causation. So that's your realistic worldview, which then, right away, when you have a realistic worldview, it, you're aware that it's sort of pressing against the unrealistic, unconscious view of your own absoluteness. So that you kind of, you're, it puts you in a little bit of a bind, the realistic worldview. But because your, your learning and your critical reflection has made it kind of strong that, well, of course everything is caused. I, if there's something uncaused, I haven't found it. If, when I find something, even that affects me, so it's a part of a causal process, whatever I find. Okay, I can have an idea of something uncaused, sure, but I haven't found one of those. Because, you know, if it's outside the causal process, my process of finding is a causal process, I can't find it. But, of course, I feel there's something really real there. I, you know, you kind of see it to yourself. So then, second branch of the noble of the therapy is realistic intention or motivation, sankalpa. Again, that's, again, theoretical. It's conceptual. Sankalpa means even totally conceptual. Because... It's not like intention, like a mm feeling, because the mm feeling is, I just want to go have some more mangoes. You know, I want to be the king. I want to be president. I want to be a billionaire. I, you know, I want, I want. That's the gut feeling. That's the gut motivation of the animal instinct, or eros. Or I want to get rid of such and such, eros and thanatos, right? Polymorphous perversity and murderous aggression. 
the, and the, the, which are the result of the fundamental delusion of the self, of the absolute self. So, realistic motivation is conceptual in the sense that I reason that everything is causal. I recognize that I have this space of uncontrolled, uncaused thing that I can't control. And so my motivation is I'm going to gain control over that. I'm going to learn about that. I'm going to become conscious of that unconscious. I'm going to experience it, be aware of it, be attentive to it, find out if it really has to control me, or if there's a place from which I can control it or not. But that's going to be my motivation. That's the primary thing that I can do in relation to the, the way of inter all these interactions with this world that is overwhelming to me. So that is where the mind, you know, everything depends upon the mind, that whole Dhammapada world comes from. It is intention to find out the real root of either suffering or maybe freedom from suffering. Because, you know, although someone gave you such a prognosis, the doctor, you don't know if he's correct, his analysis, yourself, right away. And actually, you subliminally don't necessarily think it's that correct. You don't think the way you feel about yourself is a delusion causing your suffering. You don't necessarily think that. But you're sort of taking, well, he's a doctor, and I am depressed, anxious, and addicted. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to maybe, okay, I'll try it out. And you get a motivation, I'm going to try it out. And then the next few things have to do with, well, who are you that you're going to try it out? How, what is your engagement in the causal process? Do you, that, that it gives you the ability to try it out. And the first thing you realize is that you are engaged in society as part of your causal process. And maybe you're not engaged with it in the most supportive way for what you've become motivated to try to do, which is to discover your reality. So the next is realistic speech. Why is that important right away? Because speech is where you join a causal mind of the collective, where you you think in terms given to you by the culture, that is your other people around you, other people in your past, etc., other people in your community. And in, even when you're thinking verbally in your own mind, your inner monologue, I love that that's in the description of this, this event that we're doing here together, is that you know the, your inner conceptual verbal mind are in using words as only finally Wittgenstein kind of admitted in philosophy, you're using words that are public. Not, they're not somehow, you made them up out of yourself. You learn them and they are part of you. So your own inner voice is speaking with a culturally determined, uh, uh, maybe over-determined vocabulary. And so realistic speech means then speech that is beneficial, that produces understanding, produces freedom, not speech that produces domination, harm, aggression, and confirms delusion. So realistic, and then that's elaborated in all kinds of ways, but it's basically not creating disturbance between you and the others uh, through speech, which is your primary way of relating to others in a way, is speech. Then realistic action, and it's separated from speech because speech is so important, but action includes, it sort of emphasizes physical interaction. And it's your ethical way of being. Are you living in a way that is harming others? Uh, are, you, are you living in a way by either by being excessively greedy about them or hostile? You, are you an arms dealer? Are you a butcher? Are you, a, you know, et cetera. You know, what kind of ethical, do you kill? Do you take from others what they don't really to part with? Do you abuse them sexually in some way? Do you use sexuality even harmfully? Sexuality being very, very important in physical interaction because it is the one in which there is a, can be a merger of self and other, and when the non, therefore the non-absolute of the self can be experienced by the human being. And so using that in a way of creating more distance between yourself and other is very harmful, both to the other, abusive to them, and harmful to yourself. By missing that lesson that your own achieved evolutionary biology can give you in that context. So, and, but, and there are also mental ethics of ha har harboring, you know, harmful thoughts, greedy thoughts, 
and deluded thought. But they don't emphasize the mental one because they've already been dealing with that with realistic worldview and realistic motivation. So the, the realistic action is the physical one. Then down at the really practical level, they have realistic livelihood. And so there it's like, are you, you know, earning a living in society? It's, it's really ethics coming down to how you're living in which society and how, how you participate in it. So those three are, co are called the higher education in ethics. In the process, Adi Shiksha means higher education. People always say training, and that's okay at some stage, but in a way, training a little bit because of the nature of our authoritarian culture, where you're supposed to be obedient to authority. Training has the idea of kind of following rules and, you know, military training, training a cat, training a dog, go to do your pee pee and poop over there, you know, et cetera, you know, sit and get your cookie, or whatever. Training is a little bit robotic, you know, and, and uh, whereas it's more of education is better because education has the idea of bringing out what is within you, you know, the good kind of education, not indoctrination, but bringing out your own wisdom, your own intelligence, your own freedom, your own sensitivity and compassion and so forth, right? So, so it, the Sheila Adishiksha is higher education and ethics. And then after that, you have a realistic effort in the sense that uh, that's very important, either to be ethical, that you have a kind of, that's the opposite of depression, actually. And I like to translate that as creativity, because it specifically doesn't mean any kind of effort. It's not effort pursuing your addictions. It's not effort robbing people. It's not effort, um, you know, executing them. It's effort in finding out the true reality it's effort in being positive ethically. It's effort in discovering your own nature of the mind. So it's kind of creativity. You can also be a creative robber, you know, killer, you know, whatever. You could be creative with that too, in a way. But we don't. We think of creativity as something positive, making something better, better and being better. <laughs> Sarah, that I'm just remembering that. Making it better. That's creative effort. Is making it better, whether or not it really will be. If it seems better to you, even the tiniest little thing, it's important to make it better, you know. And, uh, and that's creative effort, you know. Like, uh, my favorite one in that is, it can be the most minute thing about making something better. Shantideva, in his ethic part, in his wonderful guide to the Bodhisattva way of life, he, he says, in all my future lives, when anybody ever asks me for direction, I will never point to the, to the kitchen this way, or to the men lines over there, or New York City is that way. I'll never point with the, my index finger. Because he doesn't say why, except in a commentary, but that means because you're kind of bossing somebody when you do that. You're kind of emphasizing, well, I know where it is, and you don't. But, and if you're being honest, then you are telling them, so you're being helpful too, but then you're adding this one little kind of bossy thing about it, asserting yourself. He said, if people ask me for directions with my whole hand, like when you invite an honored guest, I will gesture, New York is that way. Like I was inviting an honored guest with my whole hand. And I will think in my own mind, right now I'm inviting you to go to the city. And someday I will invite you to go to Nirvana. <laughs> like an honored guest. So this difference between those two gestures is making it better in giving someone direction. <clears throat> a minor thing, but he makes a big thing out of it. I love it. I truly do. And you can see it in some cultures. In, in, in Japan, you know, there's a little bit like uh, hospitality, you know. It should be taught in, in uh, hotel school. <laughs> you should teach that. You know, when the client comes and says, where's the coffee shop? Instead of saying, oh, it's over there. So or put your head like, oh, there's the guy behind the, the, the concierge. Oh, yeah, I don't want there. I never like that. If they learned in hotel school, a Dharma hotel school, mine was. Oh, you're going there. I know, I know. So, so that's, 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 uh, that's realistic creative effort. And then you have realistic mindfulness. Yay, number seven. <laughs> if I've been counting right, I haven't forgotten one. Realistic mindfulness. And that mindfulness, the word we are translating mindfulness, just is the word for memory. So realistic memory. 
And here, you know, the way it's taught here, right, and that's what's part of it, is to try to remember that you're in the present. <laughs> you know? And instead of thinking about what awful things happened yesterday or what great things happened yesterday that are not happening today and feeling, you know, mad or sad, be, put more of your focus, sort of rein your consciousness to be aware of the present and what's actually going on in your mind. So the word smriti or sati in Pali, smriti in Sanskrit, means smr. It's like a, it is an introspective, even the sound of it, especially in Sanskrit. Sa is like that, but smr. You know, M-R, smur, like a smurf. Smur, smur into your, bring your mind into yourself. And be, be, be aware of your being aware, you know. And go deeper with your awareness. And that's, that's, that's again, realistic mindfulness. Meaning realistic mindingness, alertness, awareness. It has all kind of components, it's broken up by it. And initially, of course, the non-judgmental is very important in the sense that if you're immediately saying, if you're immediately pushed, pushed by your sense of self-identity that I'm a Mr. Goody Goody or Miss Goody Goody, then you're not going to be a one to be aware that, well, I have a killer mind in here, I have a lustful mind in here. You know, you're not going to want to be like Jimmy Carter giving an interview to Playboy about how he sinned in his heart or whatever it was. You know, Aslan Abdul Fah was sinned in my mind. You know? <laughs> sin, but after Jimmy. You know, you don't want to, any thoughts, thoughts like that you want to suppress, so then you won't go deeper into your unconscious. Fundamental thing about Buddhist psychology, connecting to, to Freud, and, et cetera, up to the, but the recent Bodhisattvas, Winnicott and Epstein, uh, <laughs> is that the unconscious should not have to be officially forever unconscious and drive you helplessly, like Daniel Kahneman tells you, where, and like the neuroscientists are still functioning on, that you can never be in control of yourself. That your conscious mind is tip of iceberg, and you're going to be driven by the, the vastness of the unconscious iceberg forever and forget about it. So therefore, find a pill. You know, that's a materialist thing, is, the, is taking that conclusion to the very unfortunate, domineering extreme of our corporate culture. So don't listen to that. Buddhist psychology reinforces those who really want to deal with, want to, want to offer the talking cure, that you can be more conscious, not just vent something out of it, but you can be conscious of it, you can find out the mechanisms in the unconscious that drive out of where? From that, the deepest one is the absolute false, the absolutized sense of self. And that's what mindfulness starts to do. And so in a way, mindfulness has both a component of meditation in it and of wisdom. Because it's exploring. Wisdom is the exploring reality part, and meditation is the one, is the concentrated, drilling deeper part. And then the drilling deeper part, so in a way, it's a kind of bridge between the first branch of the, of the noble path, which is realistic worldview, and the last branch, which is realistic samadhi, samadhi. And the of samadhi deep means intelligence again, the thought or intelligence. And ah means addressing something, and sam means totally. So it's, one, it's defined as chittasya ekagrita, one-pointedness of mind. So it's where you really are not distracted by anything, and it is, it's what we think of as the sort of highest type of meditation. But it's bridged in mindfulness between you're knowing something, should, or everything should be causal, my impulse to be addicted, my impulse to be depressed by to think that I'm, I'm the absolute and it's just no good and like I'm going to shoot myself or something. You know, where it goes when you listen to your, your deluded inter -mon inner monologue that tells you no good, like famous Meister, you know, Meister Eckhart Tolle, you know, did, you know, if you know his story. And, uh, and it bridges between the first and the, and the last mindfulness. And, and, but it has to be based on that creativity, it has to be based on the ethical basis. So mindfulness, although sometimes it's put with meditation in the higher education in mind, it also can be part of the higher education in wisdom. It's a, it's a thousand year, multi-thousand year debate within the Buddhist scientists, within the Buddhist psychology as to which it goes to. Because really it goes to both, mindfulness does. The bare attention has a wisdom component because it's seeking reality. And of course the bare attention has a concentration 
because it's trying to, you know, not be distracted by unrealities. Okay. And then finally, realistic one point concentration. And the point is, you don't just, now I'm doing realistic ethics, now I'm doing realistic concentration, now I'm doing realistic worldview. Basically, the Eightfold Path, they're just the limbs of the path, and you want to encompass the whole path if you want to reach, because the whole path as a whole becomes a cause of freedom. Although then, there, once you, when you get close to it, then, when you get close to it, then the causal process opens you beyond cause and non-cause, beyond concept and non-concept, beyond, it doesn't bring you into non-conceptuality, it's, 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 it's just as much beyond non-conceptuality as beyond conceptuality. It's like, you can have a theory about this apple is really delicious and it has this and that and those kind of things and that other and I eat it, it keeps the doctor away and all many things, but actual <laughs> eating an apple where sort of the boundary between you and apple dissolves and you, it transcends a really delicious one, maybe transcends your concept even of an apple temporarily, then that's experience. And you've gotten to your deeper experience where you're not separating yourself by some notion of I'm experiencing, and you're having a non-conceptual experience. We call it non-conceptual, but it's beyond the duality of conceptual and non-conceptual, really speaking. You can't find either yourself or the experience in it. You're lost in it. You're blown away in it. And that's really important. Okay? So that's the four noble truths, and that's, the, that's psychotherapy, that Buddha applied initially to these five really screwed up guys. They literally screwed up. Like that. You know, when you don't cut your fingernail for years, it grows around your finger. You can find, if you go to India, you'll find yogis in, at the Kumbha Mela or in Batharas who have fingernails growing like that wow. around their finger. It's very funky. <laughs> really. Cleaning your fingernails is a nightmare. And then, of course, they don't bother. Okay, so now we're going to go have lunch, and I did run over, I'm sorry, I was trying to do it as quickly as I could.